Hello. I think we're live. I hope we're live. Yeah, apologies for being late. We had a bit of a upside down effect with the phone, <laughs> but if we're back you, to normal now. Yeah, if any of you saw me live at Christmas and, and the whole thing was upside down and back to front, that was happening again. Somehow we've managed to fix it. So I think we've got comments enabled and stuff. I have no idea. Melissa should be on the other end. Uh, do you want to just send her a message yeah. to let her know we are? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and she'll be feeding us some questions. So we'll just give it a moment. Oh, I can see people arriving now. That's good. So we'll just give it a moment. Oh, I can see people arriving now. That's good. So uh, hopefully Melissa's monitoring questions for us. We'll just, give it, we'll just give it a moment. Oh, I can see them popping up. Hi, Ken. Thanks for letting us know that uh, some of you are there. We'll just give it a moment, let people arrive. Apologies for, for our, from our side for being five minutes late. We've just had a pretty amazing week of adventure through some incredible mountains uh, in the far north of Vietnam along the Chinese border, uh, underneath all of Vietnam along the Chinese border. Uh, underneath all the other videos that we've posted, there are links to an album of those pictures. I uploaded about a hundred or so to that album last night. I'll make sure I put the link under this video when we finished and uh, please go and have a look, go and check them out. So the purpose of this is to answer your questions about travel photography. Please, please, please start posting some questions. Ask us anything you like related to travel photography, photographing in remote places with, you know, maybe tribal peoples, with being outside of your comfort zone and maybe how we can deal with it. Please do not ask us questions about cameras or or which is the best lens because it just means it's a bit of a, a waste of everybody's time you know i'm sorry to sound harsh but that's the way it is so um yeah please start posting some questions anything you want to ask about about travel photography about photographing in remote areas about getting outside of your comfort zone to do that because simon is a very very experienced lifestyle and travel photographer he has you know worked for well go on simon you tell <coughs> me who you've worked for well uh, corbis and getty images um photographing uh, just lifestyle and, and shooting globally uh, in different countries china india europe um basically all over the world so um so yeah it's uh, it's a great experience to be out doing uh, travel photography and uh, just you know really interesting and uh, remote locations mm. and you know, I mean, I've learned a huge amount from Simon in, in just how to approach people, how to just go up to a complete stranger in a field, you know. OK, here's someone. Ken's just asked, how do you find a guide to help you find remote places? And that's a very good question and something we've had to invest a lot of money in for running workshops, yeah, yeah. because finding the right guide is difficult. What do you want to say about well, that, Simon? It, I'm just going to move the camera a bit here. You hold the microphone. Yeah, sorry. It, it, it takes us a, a long time to find the right guide. Um, most of our guides, it, it takes several trips. I mean, putting these workshops together, it's not just going and just finding a travel agent and then just uh, going off and say, oh, okay, you can do the tour. It takes a lot of time to, for the guides to understand what we require because a lot of the guides, guides, they are used to taking people to typical tourist destinations and it's very easy. They put people on the bus and then they go to, say, Halong Bay or just a, you know, and then just the very popular tourist destinations. And it's and a it, case of like, right, everyone off the bus, five yeah, minutes, click, click, back on the bus, and that doesn't work yeah. if you're a photographer. And we're looking for authentic experiences off the tourist trail, off the beaten track. And uh, it takes time for them to realize, because we'll, be we'll be with them doing a recce in a car, and we see something along the side of the road, and it's like, stop, 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 stop. And they say, why do you want to stop? We've got to go to the destination. Mm. And there, mm. there'll be a herd of buffalo coming down with the, with the buffalo herder, and it just makes for a fantastic picture. And, uh, you know, they're, oh. So why we, do you we, want to photograph that? that. That's, yeah. that's kind of, you yeah. know. So, like, in, 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 in finding a guide... Thanks, mate. We've got to share the microphone. We want the sound to be as good as possible. In finding a guide, you have to put some work into it. Um, finding the right guide is critical. You really need to do a bit of research in advance. I'd also recommend not using public transport. Now, I know there's costs attached to this. I'm going down to the Mekong next week um, with Melissa to do some research for another workshop. We're hiring a local guy who has come through recommendations so that he can speak the language, interpret things, he can tell, 
you know, people who are herding buffalo or whatever, that what we want them to do, please just stop a minute. You yeah, know, it's, or, it's, it's nurturing a relationship. It is nurturing a relationship and precisely what Simon said about getting them to understand that, that you're a photographer, you're not a tourist because they will want to rush you to the next place quickly. It's about getting them to understand you'd rather see less places but understand them better so you can shoot them better. Yeah. How you find one, if you have a contact in a country, then ask them if they know someone who can help you out. And uh, yeah, you probably have to pay them accordingly. OK, we have a question here from Nick Flanagan. I can't read the expressions on the locals sometimes. Are they happy to be photographed in most cir circumstances? It's a good question. And it's a, it's a cultural thing, isn't it? I mean, in some cultures, people remain reticent. I don't know, I, I find that here. I find quite often you go to photograph someone and they have a, you said they sort of look at you with a deadpan face. But if you go, hey, you okay? And yeah. then they'll change. But also I think it's important not to try and engender an expression. What would you say about um, well, that? Well, this is what we teach on the workshops is actually teaching how to engage with the local people, how to get into their space and how to feel comfortable around them. And once they feel comfortable, with you around them, then they will let you into their space. And uh, that's very important. And that's what we teach on workshops. Uh, it's, it's actually how to, um, Sorry, I'll do it. how to interact with the locals. Uh, sometimes this is a question of sitting around and having tea with them and talking with them and chatting and laughing. And then you slowly, you know, just pick up a camera and just say, you know, may I take your photograph? And if he says yes, you know, mm. you take a couple of snaps, you show the photograph to them, and, and then that breaks the ice. Mm. And then the magic begins to happen. And, you know, sometimes it's a question of just sitting around and just sitting with them. And, and sometimes pictures come to you instead of you trying to find the pictures. Absolutely. We call it picking a spot. Yes. You know, not that kind of looking a spot. spot. But it is about picking a spot and waiting for something to happen. And you don't always want a big smiley face. And so sometimes it can be a good idea to shoot first and ask permission later. Um, gauge it. And this is where your guide or your fixer can come in. They can, they can help you. There were times, for example, they'll tell you what's safe. We were driving through the mountains the other day. Simon saw a little kid leading a buffalo down through some rice paddies and it looked awesome. And, you know, Simon said, you know, cow, cow, can we stop, 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 stop? Kid with a buffalo and cow said, no, it's not safe. He said, if we all jump out of the bus now, it may startle the buffalo and then the kid might get hurt. You know, we hadn't kind of considered that. We, we were kind of thinking photographically. Um, a guide is well worth having. Okay. Reading expressions, it's something that comes as you get used to the culture. The thing to realise, guys, is this isn't a five minute thing. Either you have to invest the time and the effort to get to know the places and the cultures so you know what will work and what isn't. Well, the alternative, of course, would be to come on a workshop with us. And we have invested, well, you know, we spent 10 days just researching in order to make a workshop in Vietnam happen. OK, here's an interesting question from uh, Jawu Lawat. Uh, have you had a bad experience when you do travel photography? Simon, you've done way more than me. You go for it. Um, I think it was probably some pate I had, which was not so good the other day. <laughs> Apart from that, I've never really had a bad experience. Um, um, he had a very uh, bad experience uh, with the pate. Uh, Trust me, he was, stop the van! <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time in 18 years, I promise. You know, uh, the street food's very clean. We go to the cleanest places. That's the first um, a little upset, I would say, I've had yeah. in 18 years of eating street food. Uh, everything's fresh. There's no fridges. People buy from the market fresh and it's cooked fresh. Yeah, it's and fresh every what's day. That? Everything's thrown away. It's not like going to a five-star hotel where they recycle the salads and put them... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll probably the be buffet. in a hotel, not yes, in the villages. Most likely. But, um, most likely. Yeah, um, a, bad, a bad thing with travel photography. No, I haven't either. Um, and this is, again, about investing the time to find out, you know, what's going to work, what isn't going to work. A bad experience would have been, as I mentioned, the child with the buffalo. Had we all steamed out of the van in our ignorance, thinking here's a great shot, spooked the buffalo and the kid got trampled to death. That would be a very bad experience indeed. Okay. You'll get a bad experience if you don't invest a little bit of time to understand the culture and, and what works and what doesn't. OK, there's a question here from Dingback19. Hi, Mike. Uh, if you photograph people living in poverty, what is your view on whether it is then ethical to whether it's ethical to give them some money? Hmm. Uh, it's a difficult question, isn't it? it I is mean, it difficult is a difficult question. question. We we usually do. We gauge it. But again, it's about understanding what is an appropriate amount of money within the culture 
of where you are? Um, well, first of all, we, we I mean, we I'll don't... Hold it, mate. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the, I'll, I'm going to do the interviewer uh, thing. If that yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, we don't necessarily photograph people in poverty. We Most of our workshops are sustainable, so we always choose locations where we will, if we go and photograph, we donate rice or we contribute to the community. Um, we don't believe in giving money per se, it's, it's tangible assets um, <coughs> and giving back to the community. So that's one of our, our takes on it. Of course, we never give money to uh, children. Mm. Um, that's a big no-no. Um, <coughs> uh, we give money to the community to help people out. So mm. we don't, you know, obviously give to begging people. Mm. And also, we, we, you know, giving some money as a thank you. We were with a, um, a whole group of people on the side of the road thrashing rice, you know, rice farmers. It's so exciting. And they were just so friendly and wonderful. We just sort of gathered them together and gave them some money as a group to say, you know, hey, go get yourselves a few beers, guys, because you've some been awesome. Some wine, yeah. Yeah, just to say yeah. thank you. Um, and we may, went, may, maybe, may, yeah, maybe if you've got a beggar on a street corner and you get involved in conversation with them, then, yeah, it may be appropriate to buy them some food, buy them some water yeah. or something like that. Typically, but, like the house we went, which they were building, the Blue Hamong house, yeah. and they were building, so we gave them some money to help contribute to building their house yeah absolutely um but but please 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 don't think it's appropriate to click it mate there you go and then wiggle it it's a new operating system don't think it's appropriate to go rushing in you know with a camera and think you can just buy photos because it does two things one is it's it's not there's no dig dignity for the person in the picture and secondly, it's, it's creating a new economy. It's messing things up for everybody because then you'll start to have people giving it angelic smiles on the street corner and then, you know, you immediately rush over and mob you 100 kids all demanding money. It's uh, use some common sense with that one. OK, from Jennifer Blocker. How do you prepare for such a trip? Do you carry lots of stuff to each place or do you pick out uh, one or two quality lenses? I'd say one or two quality lenses, wouldn't you? Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Yeah, I mean, don't carry tons of kit because you've got to lug it around. If you've got to climb up halfway up a mountain to get you know, the, the shot you want from the angle you want, don't carry tons of stuff. If you have a look at the album of my pictures um, that I've got on Clickersnap, for every single one, pretty much, is taken with an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. It's, it's small, it's easy. Why, why would you need anything else? It's very versatile. Maybe a good lens to use if you've got one is something like around an 80 millimeter on full frame or equivalent with a very wide aperture. It's great for street portraiture because you've got an incredibly narrow depth of field. Um, long lenses look good too, but don't carry tons and tons of stuff. Personally, I tend to use just my, where is it, it's here somewhere. That is pretty much, well, that's what I shot almost everything in that gallery with. 18 to 55 mil lens on my little Fuji. It's also less intimidating for people. If, if you've got something small and compact, or even if it's a DSLR, it doesn't matter. But, you know, if you're like, wait there, wait there, wait there, I, I'll change lenses and get the tripod out and, you know, big, big light or a reflector or something. Simon, anything else we've got going on here? Hey, I can see that there were from uh, Stuart... Uh, Kincaid, I see from your Vietnam videos that tripods, tripods were not in use. Any reason? It's more stuff to carry. Um, we had some tripods in the van, and had there been some night photography opportunities, we'd have used them. But if you don't need a tripod, why use it, you know? If there's enough light that you can handhold your shot, handhold your shot. Um, I'm a huge fan of tripods, and as, as I'm sure you know. But if you don't need to carry a tripod halfway up a mountain, why use it? Um, you know, you can shoot beautiful landscapes and hand hold it. You don't necessarily have to have a tripod. We all had a truck, well, there was a couple of tripods in each van. But you also, you can't really shoot people, you can't shoot life with a tripod. It's, it's a little bit too slow. Jack up the ISO if the light's not so good. Okay, um, back to Lay. What's your best icebreaker when you can't speak the lingo? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on circumstances. If you don't speak the local language, it's about thinking up a way to break the ice, you know. If somebody's eating their lunch, then maybe just smile at them and go, you know, smile and go, hey, good, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like that, you're breaking the ice. 
Um, what would yeah. you say, Simon? Yeah, it, precisely that. And uh, we always have an interpreter as well. So um, we sometimes we ask them questions about what are you? Yeah, what are you? They're interested to know well, what are you mm. having for lunch? And you know, sometimes you know they'll say, "I'm having." Would you, would you like to try some? Mm. You know, they're, they're, it's often about sharing experiences and. Uh, very and much, yeah. um, and and that kind of like breaks the ice when you interact with them and um, and 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 share share a moment with them. Absolutely, it is. It's about interacting. It's not about taking photos. It's about making photos, and it's about either creating a moment through your interaction with a person with a subject. Um, it's not about taking a photo. Personally, I like shooting with a short lens. I mean, I, if you look at look at the photos I posted, you'll see there's a few in the Buffalo Market. You know, and I'm shooting at 18 millimeters, you know, and I'm, and I'm kind of like in here somewhere really, really close to the person um, and shooting there. So they're well aware of the fact that I'm there, but I'm just sort of smiling and being friendly and not being furtive. I think it's very important not to be furtive <laughs> yeah. because if you are feeling nervous and furtive and like you shouldn't be doing it, you're going to broadcast that. We all have a kind of telepathy that picks up on these things. Just be open, be authentic, and be honest. And if someone doesn't like it, they might go, no, 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 don't, no, please, no, I don't want my... And you just smile and go, yeah, no worries. Yeah, and there's a lot of questions, actually, um, generally speaking, what's the best lens to take? Well, there isn't... Uh, generally speaking, I find most... I would say... I would say about 70% I will probably do on a 28 to 70. It's a good general purpose lens for travel photography. Mm. But there again, you're going to find a need for a longer lens at some point which is a 70 to 200 so those are my typical two standard kit lenses mm. of not kit lenses but my two lenses of choice so mm. i cover i cover everything from wide to telephoto i mean i i although i shoot with the 18 to 55 nearly all the time i um, also carry uh, a, a 10 to 20 mil and a 55 to 200 mil i have them in the bag with me um, because there are times when something's useful. If you look at the the album of my pictures, there's there's some photos taken in a place called Train Street. You'll see them in there if you go and have a look. And it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little narrow street, and this huge locomotive comes through there, you know, and everybody has to literally stand flat against the wall. But to capture that environment, I had to shoot at 10 millimeters, so it's a very, very short angle. Um, if you watch the video of us doing the, the photo retouching and the feedback in the homestay, the beautiful place that I put up yesterday, um, Layla has an awesome picture of a guy in the buffalo market and the buffalo's got his head up and all the rest of it. And she was shooting with a longer lens and down low. Focal range somewhere from 10 to 200 millimeters. Yeah. If you can cover that, I'd say you've got everything covered. Yeah. Andy Williams. Um, how does time of day and weather play a role and affect how you take photo of photos when you travel? What are some trips you have for taking po photos in less than ideal? Yeah. What are some, some tips. tips you have for taking photos in less than ideal lighting weather, light weather conditions? We've had a bit of that on this trip. We have indeed. We have indeed. We've uh, got um, we've got. All sorts of different types of photographers. We've got some some people who are who are you know people photographers. We've also got Mr. Robin Millet. You'll have seen in a few of the videos who's far more landscape. And he said, I don't like lens flare, and I don't like photographing people. I'm a landscape man. And yet again, if you saw the video in the homestay when we were looking at people's pictures, he had that amazing shot with the with the lens flare and and the rice yeah. harvest and the people. So it's about shooting what is appropriate for the weather. Yeah, so well, um, all, all of our workshops, destination workshops in, in Asia especially, are designed for something for everybody. So it's landscape, landscape and people. Um, this year we had a bit of bad luck. We had luck. a lot of. We had a lot had of, a, a lot of we haze. Al we always choose the optimum time of year, mm. uh, which is the end of the rainy season going into the warmer season. So we're just getting that transition period. Uh, so we still should get some nice rain clouds, big skies, uh, and <coughs> just at the end of end of that, they're starting to harvest now, going into the dry season. Oh, okay. um, but this year we had we had a lot of haze, and um, it was totally unexpected. So it kind of like wasn't so great for landscape photography, um, but. What it did, I was speaking to Bartos, who was on our, on our course, so he's traditionally a landscape photographer, and 
he wanted to photograph people, and he had no, he, he was a bit uncomfortable. It was the first time he tried it, but it forced him out of his comfort zone, and he had a great time. He said, "I came here to, you know, photograph landscapes, but had no choice because it was wasn't the ideal optimum conditions. It was very hazy, so he concentrated on photographing people, and he came up with some fantastic images. Mm. And he said, "I would never have done that if, you know, if I would have just been photographing landscapes if the, if the." Uh, lighting conditions were optimum. Mm. So it's like anything, there's never any ideal, well, very rarely do you get ideal perfect conditions, and you just have to work with it. And everyone's just, come, come, even though we didn't have fantastic images, we've come out with, with brilliant images, everyone. Even Absolutely. though some of the landscapes, we had some nice misty scenarios where it started to cloud over, and it's... So, you know, I, I'm just yeah. showing you that one because, as you can see, there's hardly any detail in the sky. It was very misty, but that mistiness creates an atmosphere you know that's what it was like there was the mist coming in through the trees and also i'm just going to show you another one where we can use the mist for people photography sorry simon carry yeah. on I'll, yeah i didn't mean to ruin your flow so it's even if it rains you know just work the rain to your advantage go out and photograph in the rain you get some fantastic reflection shots you get some you know fantastic interaction with people sheltering uh, from the rain and uh, it's um, yeah, it's just it's work it to your advantage. Absolutely, here it is. This is the one okay. I was wanted to show you. And just quickly, you may have seen another one like this in the image gallery with her looking the other way. But you see how the mist in the background in the mountains it gives us a perfect opportunity to have a nice sort of clean background, but it's telling the story of where this person is. You know, you can see there's mountains and clouds and mist, whereas if it was blinding sunshine, the background could well have been in conflict with the picture of the lady. There's another one which I like more, where she's actually looking at the view rather than looking at me, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me get some more questions back for you, because I've now kind of messed up everything. Where is, sorry, Melissa. Poor Melissa, she's feeding us your questions. Here you go, Simon, let's put that back as it should be. Here you go, I'll grab one. So, David, where's he gone? David, David Cherry, how much planning goes into a photo? Do you have an idea of what you want before you are even in the country? No. <laughs> uh, we have an idea of what's going to be here because we've been here before and, you know, we obviously do a bit of research and, and know something of where we're going. But the opportunities are things you go with. With practice and experience, you can see something and think, that will make a great picture. And, and in your mind, you go, I know what I need to do with this. And kind of as you're getting out of the van, you're, you're, you're applying the focal length. You know, it's like Simon will often, or myself, will be jumping out of the van with a bunch of students and say, guys, this is a long lens shot. Set your zoom long. You know, don't change lenses. You haven't got time. It's, it's, it's practice that comes with it. So, you know, the scenario again of the <coughs> child leading the buffalo down, down the road, it could be either, you know? It's, it's like, I, in my mind, I see a very intimate shot close to the child buffalo wide lens, because I kind of like that, but it could also work by isolating them with a long lens. With practice, you can, you, you've got to see photos, you've got to think photos. You've got to, you, the photography is, not, is, is, is in our heads. It's about seeing the picture in your mind as you see a scenario and then being able to translate that into camera settings. Robin Wilkinson, um, <clears throat> what are some of your favourite happy accidents? Oh, there's so, <laughs> so many. many. Yeah, so many. You go, um, Simon. Well, we went to uh, a buffalo market uh, one of the early mornings um, in Khao Sun in Vietnam. And it was an amazing experience. Um, obviously, the buffalo market, everyone brings their mm. livestock to sell. And it's hustle and bustle. And it was just great. We got in amongst the buffalo. And there was so much activity going on. And um, <clears throat> you kind of, we, we call it working a shot. You find a place and you, you know there's something, or you find an angle and you know, oh yeah, there's, there's something really going on here. And you try and wait for that decisive moment. And you're, you're trying to go, oh, this person just a little bit to the left. And then someone walks in and blocks them. And it's, oh no. So we, we've come up with this kind of like formula where we kind of like work a shot for 15 minutes and we try and stay there and trying to get that person in the right place and uh, and then oh someone's walking in front of you and the buffalo moves in front of you mm. and to be honest yeah that's when a happy accident comes into play sometimes you, you know what you want 
sometimes the magic just happens in front of you. As you, you can go for that decisive moment if it works out, mm. but quite oh. often or not, it's a happy accident that, oh, it just happened then, and that was, that was the magic. Yeah, absolutely, I would say that a huge amount of travel photography is happy accidents, because you might have an idea of this is a good spot, I think there are some photos living here, then the happy accidents are when things happen in that place. Again, slow down, don't be in a big hurry, don't think you're gonna shoot hundreds of pictures all at once and they're all gonna be breathtaking back on the bus and leave invest time in a place watch what's happening because the happy accidents often are the photos um again look at the video uh, the last video i posted where you know robin was showing us his pictures you really have a look at that picture of his with the rice farmers um you know and the girl's looking at him a happy accident he's framing his shot he's watching now it could be argued he waited for her to look and if she hadn't looked he wouldn't have pressed the trigger or maybe he was going to shoot it and she looked at him at the right moment these things happen all the time when layla shot the buffalo wrangler you know the guy wrangling the buffalo's head um across the buffaloes it's like she's watching and layla is particularly good at decisive moments it has to be said um there are many happy accidents, and what are our favourites? Gosh, I don't know. I think my favourite was at Angkor Wat on a workshop in Cambodia a couple of years ago, where the monks tend to play hide and seek with you. They will they will do something amazingly statuesque, and they'll watch a couple of photographers raise a camera up, and then they'll either scream "No photo" and they'll laugh like children and run off. This particular guy, um, he flipped his robe over, he bent down, grabbed his robe, flipped it over his head, jumped down three big steps and ran off, shrieking with laughter. And I was just, the happy accident was, I had him framed because I was coming from a different angle. He hadn't noticed me, he'd seen his other photographers over there. And as he bent down to grab the robe to throw it over his head, I just caught that moment. And it looks as though he's doing something really cool and just sort of arranging his robes. Actually, he was about to pull a practical joke on us. <laughs> Jennifer Blocker, what has been your most memorable location? Mm. Go on, Simon. Um, well, they're all memorable locations, and we were talking. What's your personal one? The Trasu Forest, in <laughs> where you're just about to go mm. um, in the Mekong Delta. Um, after this workshop, Mike's going to do um, a, a tour of Mekong Delta. I'm, re I'm, I'm recceing for another workshop, yeah. which may begin in Cambodia um, and come down into it, the Mekong in Vietnam. Yeah, it was just a beautiful boat ride through a, a, a forest. Um, a, a bamboo forest and then uh, through mangroves and winding your way down the river and then you come out to this opening with a just beautiful nature reserve in the middle of this forest it was kind of like a, a Shangri-La it, it was it was really magical um, and well some of the some of the mountains we've been in this week have been very memorable mm. with a, uh, terrific mm. terrific beautiful rice terraced paddy fields uh, how about yours Mike I think Gosh, it's really it's a really tough one because the, there are so many amazing locations from some stuff I shot a few weeks ago doing a one on one course with somebody on, on the banks of the River Thames in London. But I think overall it's in Myanmar and there's a place called the UBN Bridge in <coughs> Mandalay. And uh, I just loved shooting that bridge. It's a rickety bridge. It's about two, three kilometers long or something crazy. Yeah. And, and all the people are walking. It's a pedestrian bridge. And everybody walks across this bridge in the evening and the sun sets and there's an old dead tree in the water. And uh, I particularly love that. There, there are many. It's a hard question. Inlay Lake in Hay Ho. Oh, markets yeah, yeah, yeah. Where all the, there's a market each week in a different location around Inlay Lake and all the hill tribes come down to mm. sell their, 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 their wares. And it's, it's literally, it, nothing's changed for centuries. And also, you're touching on a very valid point there, and that is right now, Burma, Myanmar, is, is pretty big news around the world because, you know, there's some really nasty stuff happening up in the north. Mm. Um, but what you've got to remember is it's not happening everywhere. And if you're thinking of going somewhere, it's very easy for us to be put off by what we see in the media. I backpacked through South Africa many, sorry, through Africa many years ago. And when I reached South Africa, I was there for a couple of months. Everyone in the UK was having kittens because all they saw on the news were, t were horrific atrocities of people having car tires put around their neck, which were then set on fire. And they were all like, what are you doing there? For goodness sake, get out. <coughs> I never encountered anything like that. All the South Africans were saying, how can you live in a country like England? It's awful because all they saw were IRA, IRA bombs going off around London. 
Yet these are minute things which the media blow out of all proportion. Yes, be safe, be sensible, but do not be frightened by these sorts of things. OK, and this leads on to a very good question by Ahmad uh, Bebas. How do you deal with hostile locals when trying to take a photo? <laughs> well, uh, this, this comes back to... We've been talk, discussing this a lot on the workshop with everyone coming from Europe, and obviously, understandably, street photography has become very difficult in Europe, North America, um, privacy issues, obviously, understandably. Mm. But the great thing about Asia is that nobody minds having their photograph taken, and it's a pleasure. And that's what people find so rewarding about travel photography, especially here in Asia, is the interaction with the locals. The interaction with the locals. We've never hardly only uh, this trip we've been six days i've only had one person that just went yeah. you know please one person was, and that was, was all please everyone else has oh it's been a yeah. it's been a dream we had it? one very grumpy lady in the mountains mm. where uh you know simon took a couple of pictures of, of this child came running up you know and this woman i think she was angry with the child because the yeah. child was running yeah. off yeah. and she was beckoning telling this child to come back and then I kind of put my foot in it with a couple of the other students by walking out onto a rice terrace. Now, you, be, you always have to be careful. Don't just walk into a rice terrace. It's somebody's food. It's somebody's farm. <coughs> but if you walk along the paths that they use, it's OK. And if you see someone, you go, hi, is, you know, you just look. You look a question. You can't speak the language. You, you know, you look a question at them. And if they don't look very happy, you go, OK, and you leave. But, yeah, I sort of looked the question at her <laughs> and she just sort of wrapped me like this. So, you know, I just, you want me to go? You know, and she so yeah, okay, she wants me to go. Leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Okay, sorry, there's there's a lot of technical questions on mirrorless cameras. Um, we it would does, love to answer your questions on that, yeah. but, but this is more, sorry, this is this more is about, about travel photography, photography techniques, techniques, tips, things we can do to answer your questions about that. Travel, the not only so much thing, te technical. If you're going to touch on that at all in any way, I would say that a mirrorless camera is great for travelers, travel, travelers. A mirrorless camera is great for travel photography because it's small, because it's lightweight, because it's it's probably just easier to carry around with you. That is not dissing a DSLR in any way. DSLR is a bit bigger and heavier, but then some people prefer a bigger, heavier camera. But that's it. A camera is a camera is a camera. A camera doesn't take a picture. You take a picture with your knowledge of light, of composition, and all that kind of good stuff. It doesn't really matter whether you shoot it on a little mirrorless or whether you shoot it on a Canon 5D Mark, whatever it is. Mm, yeah. Danny Lewis, do you use any artificial light on your travels? Not at all. Never. Totally natural light. And obviously, we start early in the morning. Um, we photograph from maybe 6.30, 7, just mm. as the light comes up, to about... 9, 10, 11, depending on lo location, before the heat, the sun is overhead. Uh, then we usually regroup, we'll go and do a workshop, we'll upload our pictures, do a critique, see what worked, and peer learning from one another, looking at pictures, seeing how we, we, we uh, approach the same subject from different angles, mm. which is great on workshops, because mm. invariably, you know, we're shooting the same subjects, mm. and but from different angles. But then, then somebody will wander off completely somewhere else. And say, Absolutely. And then, you know, they, they don't want to be in the crowd, which is understandable, and they'll go off and they'll find a little corner mm. and they'll find something totally new. And then we come mm. back and say, where'd you get that from? And mm. oh, I just walked over there. And <laughs> Marie, who's been on this trip with us, she's, she's, she's brilliant at that. It's like, where's Marie gone? And I go, oh, she's over there, shooting from over there. But, um, sorry, what was, the, what was the question again? I've lost do, my track. Do you use artificial light? Do you use artificial light? No, because the whole part of the travel photography is the light is part of the travel. The light is what it is in the place where you are. So, no, don't use artificial light. It's not to say you can't, but... If you want something that's that's real, that reflects where you are, go with what you've got. But shoot appropriately. You've got to understand light. There may be a, a situation. We were in a little. We were in a Hmong village, or was it a Zhao village, the other day, and there was an elderly lady standing outside her house, and she was more than happy for us all to take pictures of her. And there was a washing line, and she was still in a great place. And the guys were starting to shoot, but the light on her face was awful because on the washing line was a black pair of trousers. So I just ran up and just smiled at her and just slid these trousers along the washing line, which allowed a bit of side light to come in, which then the quality of light improved. 
don't get hung up about uh, quantity of light. Quality is important. The shots we all did on Train Street, it was nighttime. I mean, I was shooting at 5,000 something ISO. I don't know what it was. It, it, it's the one that worked. Because you can't photograph that with artificial light. Um, got a question on post processing. Do you have a stance on post processing? This is from, sorry, that's jumped. Um, this is from Dingbat19. Do you have a stance on post processing? What is, what is too much? And do you remove unsightly elements? Well, I mean, that is for up to each photographer to choose their own way. I would say if you're going to just shoot JPEG, what's happening is you are allowing your camera to interpret the image for you because the camera is doing the post-processing for you. The camera has no innate creativity of its own. If you do your own, you can make the picture look the way you saw it because cameras see light differently to people. When it comes to photoshopping things out, yeah, you know, it's a big argument to crop or not to crop? Do you keep it full frame to, sh to show that your composition was perfect in the first place or do you crop it? It's not a question we can answer really. I would say we shoot a raw file, we develop our own raw files so we can make the picture ours the way we want it to look. It's not about fixing something that's broken or making something artificial. Tony Fletcher, what is the bravest thing you've ever done when it comes to photographing and photography tra and traveling? traveling? Um, well, I think for a lot of people, first time on a workshop is they've never really photographed people, mm. and it's breaking that comfort zone of learning and being in a different to, culture. Being in a different culture, yeah, mm. and um, you're just trying. That can be a very brave thing. We had a, a fellow with us from New Zealand a while ago. And he was horrified at the thought of, you know, we're taking pictures of children, of kids running around and doing stuff. And he was like, yeah, but you can't do that because, you know, in, in New Zealand, in the UK, in Europe and all the rest of it, if you're seen anywhere near a school gate and you've got a camera, then, you know, there's a witch hunt going on. But the thing is, it's, it's not about that. It's the fact that the kids just love it. And then they drag you off to come and show my mum, come and show my dad, you know. And we do carry a little Hewlett Packard, you know, or was it blue band connected printer thing to try and give some pictures to the people? Yeah. Um, and bravest thing for me was eating insects. <laughs> you had to go on a tarantula leg, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I chewed on a tarantula leg one evening to see what it was like, and I thought it'd be all crunchy and horrible. Actually, it was like a very pleasant sort of a soft skin sausage and a bit of mekong water rat. But yeah, yeah, I haven't tried that. You're going to try it next I week. I am going to try it. I'm really looking forward. Maybe to you could that. do a video on it. We're going to have to wrap this up in a moment or two, guys, because we've actually gone on longer. I hoped we'd only be going for half an hour. So it's really amazing to have so many of you here with us, joining in and asking us these awesome questions. Um, let's just do okay. maybe two more. Okay, Sam Ol. Um, Sam Ol what? Yeah, no, so, so Sam Ol what? Uh, so what, how extensive is the pre-trip planning uh, had to be to, to be put in to make your trip worthwhile for photographic journey, or do you just go without an agenda? On a workshop, there's an enormous amount of work goes into making these work. Simon's wife, Sharon, is um, a producer. That means her job has historically been organising lighting, film crews, camera crews, logistics, getting things in the right place, and she's very good at it. Sharon puts a huge amount of work into making sure that, you know, we've got reliable drivers who are going to interact with us and be happy about the fact we might want them to long hours, work, work long hours, about making sure we've got fresh water in the vans at all times about making sure that our fixes are good, about making sure there'll be somewhere to stay, about, yes, there is a huge amount of pre-planning goes into these workshops, um, you know, and one of the benefits of coming on a workshop with Simon and I is, of course, we've done that for you. We've, I would say, hours total put into making this one, we were what? Well, there was 10 of us with the film crews and the location scouts yeah. and the fixers <clears throat> and the drivers spent 10 days exploring the mountains to find out where to take you guys. What worked and what did what not work. What did work, what didn't work, what's a good location, what isn't, what is a great location but it's just too far. Finding That's... the best accommodation. Exactly. And accommodation is scarce. This is something which uh, <laughs> is a stupid question which I'm going to share in a minute. Um, it's 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 a question. I've lost my thread. Thank you, Thor. Um, where was I, Simon? Uh, putting effort into the workshops. Putting effort into the workshops. We put a huge amount of effort into into planning these things. So the benefit is we've done the work for you. That's not to say you can't go and travel somewhere and take it on spec. You're not quite sure what's going to happen. 
But yeah, we put an enormous amount of work in, hundreds and hundreds of hours. And were it not for Sharon, we're the creative ones. Sharon's the one who, who makes shit happen, you know. OK, um, Macau Nutrition Association, uh, good one to end up on. Any trip plans to same place next year? Well, Other locations perhaps? Yeah, well, that is kind of topical. There is a possibility. I would, I would say, yes, there'll be something in Asia, definitely. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of looking at one location in particular that we've been on this workshop and thinking about, well, you know, we could possibly run a continuous one, that, one there. As we've mentioned already, I'm going down to the Mekong Delta next week with Melissa to explore and do a recce for another workshop. So, you know, again, you know, I'm spending a lot of money on driver, fixer, location. I've made contact with some organizations down there that do some really good work, some social enterprise work, you know, in helping people get out of poverty. By teaming up with them, they're going to they're gonna show me the good work they do so I can hopefully, hopefully publicize it to you guys. And if we get that workshop going, then some money from anyone who comes with us will go into doing a bit of good there. Plus, you get to photograph some awful, awesome stuff. Um, so, yeah, sorry, short answer would be we're looking at one which may begin in Siem Reap in Cambodia with Angkor Wat and all the good stuff that's already on our <laughs> existing Cambodia workshop. But then we'd fly down to Phnom Penh and then take a boat down the Mekong, the Mekong River. River to Vietnam into the Mekong Delta. Uh, that will be a longer workshop, obviously. It's probably going to be a couple of weeks long to make that work. But it's two countries, Cambodia and Vietnam. Two countries in one workshop. So, so yeah. that is a possibility, depending on what I find in the Mekong when I go yeah. down there. Um, I just want to share sorry. the ridiculous question which came up from um, my partner in crime called Thor in Iceland, who I run the Iceland workshop, he just wanted to know what aperture that you should use for shooting mermaids. <laughs> <laughs> he just flashed across the screen and <laughs> thought you're an ass. <laughs> and David Walker, to end on, do you get a chance to relax? Maybe a G&T G &T or two. <laughs> They're full on. The workshops are full on. This is an adventure. Um, they are full on. It's not just a case of, you know, we chill out every evening because sometimes we have to drive quite a long way. Sometimes the roads we're traveling on are extremely rough. We're lucky to average 10 miles an hour, you know, for a couple of hours sometimes. So, yeah, when there's a chance to chill out and have a G&T, we do. But generally speaking, when we, when we finish shooting for the day and we head back to a hotel, it's really a case of a quick shower, mm -hmm. something to eat, and then people generally want to go to their rooms, download their Bit images. processing, review. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, tonight's the last night. Every, pretty much everyone's leaving today. Uh, yeah, we've got to see Bartosz off. We've got to go and see Bartosz off, yes, because he's the first to leave. But um, the rest of us, we're going for a bit of a farewell dinner. Yep. And... Uh, it's great to see them all. So, you know, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up here. And thank you all so, so much for coming. It's really exciting to see how many of you are interested in this. Um, you can see, as I've said a couple of times, my images from the workshop at um, a link below this video, which I'll post in a minute. If you're someone who thinks you'd like to join us on what we've just discussed, such as the two country workshop or in Hang Su Fi in Vietnam, where we've <coughs> just been, then you can leave me your contact details at photographycourses.biz forward slash one, two, three. I will leave the link below. But please, if you know you're someone who is more of an armchair explorer, you think, you know, yeah, well, I'd like to, but you know in your heart it's not something you're going to do. Please, please, please do not give us your details. Because what happens is we think, oh, there's over 100 people want to go. We put in a massive amount of work and cost setting it up. Maybe four or five people book it. And then we have to cancel it. And that is a terrible waste of everybody's life. So if you know in your heart it's not something you're going to do or you know it's outside of you know, your price range because it is expensive um, to set all this up, then please, please, please don't, don't leave your details. If, you, if it's one of those things you think, yep, if the date works, I'm going, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I can't think of anything well, else I ought to add. Yeah. Also, the personality type. If you're someone who's... who's you know, there are times when there's a mudslide, you know, and we've got to go a different route or we've got to get out the van and put some logs on a ditch to get the van yeah. around, you know, a, a, a bit of road that, that we can't get through. Those things happen. The unexpected happens. This is an adventure workshop. Yeah. And if you're someone who gets a buzz out of the thought of that, then join us. Yeah. We'd love you to be with and, us. And it's all about working at pictures. You can't you have to go through 
the rough sometimes. You, you do. You, you can't expect beautiful images to be presented in front of you. You've, you've got you've got to work at it. You've got to put in the effort. The pictures you saw when we in the video at the homestay. Um, those pictures wouldn't happen if these guys weren't prepared to bump up incredibly rough roads and be in a hot, sweaty environment with, you know, rice dust prickling the back of their neck. Yeah. You can't do that by taking the dog for a walk in the local park. Sorry, but mm. it's true. Okay. Guys, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I wish we could have... I'm, I can't tell you how many questions we've got yep. here which Sorry we couldn't answer. That. But uh, if this has proved so popular, maybe when we're both back in the UK in a month or so's time, um, please put, and put a comment below this. If you'd like us to do another travel photography thing and we'll prepare it a bit more, maybe show you some images. Behind the scenes pictures. Behind maybe, the scenes what pictures. You expect. Yeah, we're happy to do another live Q&A about travel photography in a while. Leave us some comments underneath. If you'd like us to do that, we'll set it up in about a month's time when sure. we're back in the UK. Meanwhile. Bye from me. And it's good night from him. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. Bye. I don't know. You stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. End. <laughs>